Mm. Oh, je ne tape vous là-bas. Désolée. I swear, my fourth to 12th grade French teachers are just shaking their head. Hey loves, it's Avac on your screen with another one. Hope you're all well. As you can tell today, we're discussing Atlanta season three, episode 10, the season finale. How are we here? Time has flown by. Before we get into this, a quick shout out and thank you to each and every one of you. It has been so great to talk about these topics, share my thoughts and get yours too. I hope that you do that in this last episode too. If you wanna to subscribe to see what it's like to live life legally blind, you can stay around for a little bit too. I'd really appreciate it. But let's get into this episode because there's so much to talk about. This was perhaps the strangest episode of Atlanta to date. And Atlanta really does bizarre with a capital B. So that's saying a lot, but let's break this one down. So this episode opens up with a scene of the OPPT, which is a restaurant in Paris. It's really good. You should go check it out. I went to Paris once, never had a bad meal. So these girls are living the highlight. I love that we roll up on these three girls Candace, her friend Zaysha, and Zaysha's cousin Shanice. And I was wondering if they're calling her Shanice to give it a little flair. Or like in last week's episode when they said spell Dante, they're playing up on our culture, switching up common names and making it unique. Who knows? All I do know is, of course, they're asking her to elaborate. Zaysha doesn't really want to know. But Candace shares with them anyway. The reason why they're here is because she got six bags to pee on somebody. Can someone say Pepe and Pere? I thought this really played up on a lot of the scandals we've heard about recently about Instagrammers being flown out to do strange things for change. <laughs> and I'm laughing at this sentiment because it's more common than we know. And I love that they kind of glaze over it and say, you know, don't shame, don't kink shame. And we move on quickly from that. It's almost as if Candace has seen a ghost and she might as well be a ghost because we haven't seen her in a lot of episodes. It's Van and she got that wig that she stole a couple episodes ago, plus a dark lip. I don't think I've ever seen Van wear that much makeup. I've never seen Van do more than a natural beat. Reminded me that the last time she did more was when they went to go see Champagne Poppy. And that's the throwback. Candace is from season two episode, I don't know, whatever Champagne Poppy was. And I said, okay. First thing, I don't know how long Van has been in Paris, but her French chef's kiss, impeccable. The accent is there. I don't know if in real life she can fluently speak French or what it is, but everything sounds really good. Très bon. <laughs> she was buying meat. She spins around. She pretends like she doesn't know Candace. And I'm thinking, Wait, why? Why are you doing this? Like, I know why I do that. I'm legally blind. So I really don't be seeing people when they come up to me. But I'm thinking, wait, is Candace? Do they have smoke? Like, what's the deal? And I figured, you know what? Van has been so off this season. Maybe she doesn't want to identify as who she used to be. She's just embodying this new persona. So I said, you know, let this go. The episode's going to explain it as we unravel. It got real weird before it made sense, but let's go with it. Van invites them to her home, her very humble abode. Her chateau is just... One thing about Paris is the most shabbiest small space is just perfection. It was so pretty in there. I love that she has her magazine cover with her on it. I said, how long have you been here, girl? The two girls are looking at each other. They slowly sit down like something is fugazi about this situation. Candace is just scoping out the scene. You know what I said in last week's episode? You can learn a lot about a person by how they keep their place. As she's scoping out the space, she's seeing the vibe. She sees the phone chime several times. I'm thinking that must be Ern. I zoomed in. I couldn't really see, but I said, who else would be messaging her a million times? Probably Ern. She picks up a photo she starts walking closer to what appears to be the drawing slash bedroom. I don't know if you guys peeped that, but when I zoomed in, homegirl doesn't even have a box spring. She has a mattress that's held up by a stack of books. I think that really spoke to what else could be around the corner that would be jarring. A lot of people live this lavish life in the living room setting, but what really goes on past that? And I think they really wanted to give that juxtaposition, especially since Candace is an influencer. So if anyone's gonna know well about holding up appearances, homegirl's got the Instagram baddie outfit on lock. The starter kit is the neutral tones, the straight hair, and the designer bag. So she knows all about keeping up appearances. And in one way, Van is mirroring that in episode. I love to say in every single review I've done with you guys that Atlanta does mirroring, reflection, and duality very well. They do a lot of things where I think, if Van was a dude, how would I be looking at this? 
Would she be escaping or just doing what guys do? And in the same way, we're looking at Candace as this instant influencer that may be doing questionable things that are now becoming more common fare because as we talk about it, it becomes more meh, you know? But on the other hand, we also see Van acting out of character, but that's what people do when they start a new life in a new place, right? So it just has you thinking about your perception of two different people, two different lifestyles, and them coming together and seeing each other after however long. I'm not sure if I misread this moment, but another thing that stuck out to me was after she said Marcel was the guy in her picture, that's her boyfriend. And I remember she said, how long are you here? And instead of answering that, Van said, we met when we were working at the restaurant and it was passionate, it was magnetic. I was like, sis, you didn't answer the question. And then Candace asked another question. She said, oh, we need to go. And that's where we began the even stranger adventure. Homegirls got the baguette. I love how Shanice is like, what's with that? <laughs> and as they go on, things just get weirder and weirder and weirder. So she goes to Alexander Skargard's place and it's just, he's just there living his best life. He's got a Shanti playing in the back. And I think there's a little bit of commentary on that of someone who's able to consume the culture but not keep up with it. He's asking about Nelly. How long ago was the whole Nelly Ashanti situation? I mean, the hug last year did cause people to talk about it again, but it's been a minute since they've been together. So he's definitely a little late and all the tracks he was playing were oldies but goodies though. I was crying and he's like, I just wanna get naked. And there's no. He said, you know, I'm just kidding, but if you want it. <laughs> Candace and Van go in the room. She's trying to figure out, are you, like, what's the deal? And Van is lacing the bedroom with stuff. I said, this escalated real quick. And she's like, no, 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 it's just a game. What kind of game is this? I'm thinking there's a reference I'm not getting here, like the haircut from the movie that she watched that she referenced at the end. There is so much going over in my head. If you can help a girl out, please do. They leave in a huff puff. I love how the two girls get up and he's in his Tarzan outfit because apparently I never seen a movie with this guy in it, but when I checked IMDb, he was Tarzan. He also doesn't like to wear pants. I noticed that when I did the Google search, but I digress. They move on to stop number two. She's got the keys. If you saw, she swiper, no swiper those at Alex's house. She opens up this box and then opens up a cooler and nothing's inside, not even ice. Things about to get dark right now. She starts freaking out. The girls are like, what's really going on? And then we see three guys rolling up, a Fetty Wap looking guy who could be Fetty Wap because the way the cameo has been going this season, who knows? And they're ready to run up on her. If it wasn't for the guy that got backed up on and then he broke the window and then they started fighting and then those three guys thought that was a more interesting fight. Initially, I thought it was kind of cool when Van lit the cigarette all calm, cool, and collected, but not her running away and telling her friends to join her after she got like a mile head start. <laughs> but just before that, they called her Tarare, which is the name of the episode. And I said, what's that? I was so confused. So I Googled it and I wish I didn't. So for those of you who don't know and want to know, because you can click the timestamps and skip this bit. Tarare was a boy who was born in 1772 France. He was a street performer who would yam everything. I mean, everything. If you go through the roster of what he ate, you might not eat today. And I thought that was very interesting, again, with the juxtaposition of this influencer, Candace, and then her friend who's acting out of character. Are they calling her Tarare because she's a street performer and they can see through the facade? Or, as we see as the episode goes, what did Homegirl do to get the main? It could go either way. It could go either way. Atlanta has an artful way of getting me to learn more things about super random things and be like, that is a real thing. This is not a Grimm's fairy tale. There was a real person in France that literally ate anything. I thought, hmm, I wonder if this is playing on the idea of society feeding into this performative arts. This idea that Tarare for a while was getting food and weird things to eat by people who would bring it to him. And instead of dealing with his disease, they chose to not idolize him, but treat him in the same way that people do with mukbangs. If you think about that excessive indulgence, right? And I really hope that they didn't mean that Van was yamming babies too, but it could speak to this idea that she's consuming things and cannibalizing something of some nature. I don't know. I'm reaching a lot in this episode. I'm starting to feel it, you know? <laughs> 
bar was so weird. Van knocks on a door. I forgot the gentleman's name, but they start to kiki about the missed engagement. So I'm going to assume he's Emilio's fiance. They walk into this magnificent museum. One thing I'm so happy about this episode is that they brought us on a trip. For someone who hasn't gone on a trip in two years, thanks to the panorama, this was a refreshing escape. Just taking in the different art and just the way they capture scenery, I'm so grateful. I loved how they pan in and the panning view, you see Emilio and the fear. Then you see his fiance telling people for me, get out, it's closed. Things got so bizarre. <laughs> Van starts a very strange soliloquy about bread keeping out. And you know, if you get a good piece of bread, maybe it's not a French baguette, but a nice piece of bread, if you leave that out for a couple hours, it's not so fresh. This girl left it out for six months. That's really the baguette that she beats down people with. That's why she carries it around all the time. When she first pulled it out, I said, what in the blade is this? Then she beat him down. I said, I need to see Zaza beats in different things because she can really act. This was acting, acting. For all that I've seen her in in the years that we've watched Atlanta, never in this light. And I've watched, not horror, because you know I don't do that, but I've watched gory things in action movies and violent movies. But I've never been as disturbed as I was watching her beat down homeboy with the baguette because it's so out of character for her. All of this for him to say it's in the vase. Denise takes the vase and drops it. Nothing's in it. The museum director nearly has an aneurysm. He says, no, no, the next vase. She puts her hand in this time, more appropriately so, and a little package. All of this for a brick? Hmm. I said, this is not drugs. This is what they want us to think it is, but that's not what it is. So she takes the package to their third stop. And I'm surprised. Why are you still following her? Personally, me, I would have said, ta-ta, bye-bye, when she started cussing off about the thing not being in the cooler back there. But okay. They decide to go with her to work. And I thought, okay, you know, a free meal. I've done it before when I worked in the restaurant. She's changing into her apron or just before she does. <laughs> I'm, I'm done. At this point, Candace has seen enough. She's like, this is not safe. Let's get out of here. Her friends are down for it now. They're, I guess they've been exposed to enough. They're like, you know, let's just see where the night goes. We ain't got no plans anyways. They go to sit down at the table. We see the announcement that was in the preview for this episode, which I thought would be more of a prominent part of this episode. Just before that, Alex Gargard runs into Van and he cusses her off and she spits in his face. And I said, this is beyond disrespectful. Van exit stage left to go to the basement to get ready and prep. She kisses on Marcel. This is standing there awkwardly. We also get a jump cut just before that of Alex getting off from being disrespected. This is so random. Back to the basement, Candace is calling her out because at this point she's just lying. She's saying they met at a strip club, but then I thought, we don't actually know where Candace and Van met. So for all we know, that could be the truth and maybe Candace is just tired of people calling her out. Candace pulls Van around the corner. She's calling her out. I said, five, four, three, two, one. I was waiting for Van to throw back the, you're here to pee pee and parry line, and she did. And I thought that was a perfect mirror reflection of two friends. Here's someone trying to get a new life. And here's someone who's not sure if this is really a new life or a facade. And then here's someone who's being judged for being an influencer. And here's someone who's also made questionable decisions in the past. It was just a ping pong moment. Typical when you do go abroad that you're going to be a little out of character and maybe experience things differently. I, I remember at some point in the pandemic, I caught myself watching all of Emily in Paris and Van having two dudes at the same time was giving that same tease. So I mean, do as you do when you're in Paris, I guess. Candace pushes a button by asking, what about Ern? What about this? What about Lottie? And it seems like that's the safe word to break this spell of this curse that this girl is in. Simultaneously, while Van is having this breakdown, this long table of people having this exclusive experience, yamming hands. It's not missed on me that Shanice and Zaysha are the only two that take off the napkin as if they don't want to be blind to what's happening around them. It's as if the elites can choose to not see and consume whatever they want and call it luxury and call it this. They take it off because they're like, why is this person screaming downstairs? Then they realize they're eating hands and the comments they make. I have not laughed that hard since episode two, okay? I just said, this is just, this is too much. This is too much. They look like they seasoned the hands, but it was so weird. And I was wondering, 
What does this mean? There has to be a different meaning. So if you guys know what that meaning is, please let me know because I was too busy laughing. I can't figure it out. I just, it was too much. <laughs> oh my gosh. Atlanta is so stupid sometimes, but that's what makes it so funny. <laughs> Again, mirror energy. If it was something more palatable like escargot or frog legs, both of which I've tried in Paris, are actually really good. Don't know if I would eat the frog legs again. Escargot I had in Marrakesh, so I have had it again. But it really speaks to how different tiers or classes of people observe things as exotic or luxury or whatever, and how some things are just not it i'm not eating a hen i would not eat a roach or an insect so you kind of decide for yourself like what is normal what is okay what is permissible alex coming through saying mm, hands like sir no the fact that you're so comfortable just shows the elitism like certain things they don't phase you the person screaming downstairs breaking all the glasses don't phase you the seasoned up hand on your plate doesn't phase you. Being able to go into something blindly doesn't phase you. A lot of people don't have that luxury and personally don't want it either because I don't want to be blindfolded eating hands, but go off. <laughs> it's so stupid. It's so stupid. I don't know why I find myself laughing at these stupid things. Oh, I'm done. I'm done. And then I thought, the only way I compare it to the name of this episode is Van did something real weird for them hands. I don't know if it's a Fetty Wap looking dude's homeboy whose hands that used to belong to and that's why he was coming for her. But this moment was very profound. You see Van breaking down and literally breaking things around her. It's this self-destruction to the point where Marcel's out of there. Candace is staying because she cares. And you see this point where Van is melting back into who she is, sort of, because we find out later in the next scene as they're sitting at a park bench that she doesn't know who she is. She feels like everyone around her knows who she is, which is a big fallacy because the truth is, who really knows themselves? The question, who am I, is a lifelong question that people maybe even on their deathbed haven't come to an awareness of. And maybe this who am I was further propelled by her experience with the death doula and seeing that trauma in episode too. I still can't believe that was one of the funniest episodes of Atlanta to date. I really, I really love the heart to heart that they had. It reminded me of a quote that I've said before, which is a good friend knows a song in your heart and sings it back to you when you've forgotten. Having Candace visit from the A was the key that Van needed to getting back to herself and realizing, you know, I was at this place where I'm driving on the opposite side of the street with my eyes closed and I feel judged by my daughter. I feel like she knows. So I came here for something, but I don't know. It was very beautiful and it was very cumulative. It was a good way of wrapping up a very loose story because we haven't seen this girl for a couple episodes. Because Atlanta couldn't just end on a sweet note, we cut to Shanice knocking on a door, a man getting to the door, and I said, I already know what this is. I knew Shanice was a little bit too interested when Candace was explaining how she got $6,000. I don't know if she replaced Candace or if she bagged her own dude. Either way, he was so particular about putting out the tarp, slowly taking off his slippers, lying down. I said, Alana, are we really doing this right now? And then we see her reflection as he pees for an eternity. I love how she told him, no, nah, I don't need that. I have two bottles of wine. In Mm. And then he starts chirkling, chirkling, choking and gurgling is what I'm trying to say at the end. And I, I couldn't even laugh because I just said, this is so weird. The season ends while you can still hear her peeing, looking at the phallus of an Eiffel Tower, talking about sexuality and domineering and gender identities and switching roles. I just keep seeing it come up. Why does a man start to choke and gargle on the... I'm done. I'm done with you, Atlanta. I thought I was done. I started jamming out to the ludicrous tune at the end. I was in the vibe so much because usually I cut it off. I just let it go to the end. All of a sudden, Ern gets a package. It's a bag and he says, that's not mine. The delivery man does not care. He said, it's got your name. You were here in May. Okay, it's yours. He's, I just want you to know it's not mine. The delivery man does not care. He leaves. Ern opens up the bag. I said, I wonder if it's Van stuff. What could this be? Slowly opens the bag. He takes out a Ziploc of prescription drugs, takes out a photograph, which they perfectly leave for us to see at the very end, and a t-shirt 
which he puts over his shoulder. And I think something else. And he starts to walk away. And I said, sir, that's not your shirt. Where are you, where are you going? And then we zoom in close up on a picture of four. And I said, that's white urn. So my theories for the last 10 weeks about the anthologies being urns dream sequence, I don't know what to do with it now. Is it a parallel universe? Is it urn subconscious like Al's coming to reality? Is it like Trinity to the Bone where that package is a message being received and it's going to come again until you get the message? In this sense, he was trying to deny something in a subconscious, but now it's coming full circle now that he's back home. What does that say for season four? Where's Darius? <laughs> we still haven't got that. There's so many answers we haven't gotten from season four yet that I can't wait. I really hope that it comes in the fall. 2021, not 2022. I hope the rumors are true. But this was a season to be remembered. There were some ups, there were some downs, but as per usual, it was really thought provoking, talking about themes and topics that we may not know about or think about as often, but are part of our lives quite often. These ideas of judgment and gaze and perception and race. And a lot of people were saying they were really divisive this season. I wouldn't say that. I would say though that they were very intentional about what they chose to shine a light on and this theme of ghosts and things being unresolved and the literal ghost, the cameo that passed away two weeks ago in last week's episode. It's all crazy. The whole thing is insane. I don't know what you guys thought about not just this episode, but the season in its entirety. I actually appreciate the anthologies more now that everything is done. Still want those five more episodes like I was saying last week, but now that I think about it, he was mixing the medicine in with the food. If he came out saying, I'm going to make a completely different series, an anthology, a black love, death, and robots, if you will, about these ideologies, maybe not as many people would watch or complain. But in the same hand, talk about serving hands, which was so gross, it's so strange to me that we come to this moment of understanding that there's so many layers and levels to see a situation in, and there's always more than there is presented to us. Bidia, 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 that's all, folks. I can't believe it's over. Season three was something for the record books. I still don't know how to feel. Overall, I'm happy Atlanta's back, and I hope it'll return quite soon. I definitely want to hear from you. What did you think about episode 10 or season three in its entirety? It was a lot. The anthologies... Now every episode feels like an anthology. I thought the dream sequences were one-offs, but was the series really a continuation of a story? No, it feels like time was lapsing. It feels like we were time traveling and time lapsing at the same time. It was just, it was a lot going on, but I'm here for it. And I can't wait to see what they do next season. I almost want to go back and watch season one and season two to see how things intertwine now that we're getting all these little cookies from past episodes. Should I do that with you guys? I thought about doing it around episode five, but I said, mm, let's just wait. Let's see if we can grow a community if enough people want to discuss this season and then we can tackle one and two. So let me know what you want me to do. Or my other thought is I can do a quick sum up each episode in three sentences now that I've seen them all and get your perspective too. Looking at something in its entirety once it's done is different from all the one off separately and just digesting them individually. Whichever way it goes, this has been an adventure. Atlanta took us on a trip, literally, <laughs> and I'm here for it. So I hope you guys enjoyed spending some time with me. I've appreciated each and every one of your comments. It's given me the opportunity to get different insight, to learn new things, to be corrected if I needed to. So thank you guys so much. And until next time, stay safe, stay sane, stay blessed. Love and later.